Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli is back in the saddle. And of course, we start things out talking about Facebook, or I guess I mean Meta, Meta book, Face. Anyway, it's all the stuff about Oculus, uh, what Facebook is going to be doing with the future of augmented reality and virtual reality, and kind of what we know now and will soon know about the company's plans for the metaverse. Then we talk about Wise's new products in honor of its fourth anniversary, or birthday as they call it, uh, an interesting camera from Canon, uh, where they've taken the PowerShot line plus some other fun functionality you can add for the holidays, Halloween this time around, with your smart home stuff. It's all that plus our picks of the week coming up on Smart Tech Today. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by userway.org. Userway ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility-related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off Userway's AI-powered accessibility solution. Hello and welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, dynamic, and, well, sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am your other host, Matthew Casanelli. Hello, Micah. How are you doing? I am doing well today, Matthew. Uh, it is a good day. I believe someone recently had a birthday, perhaps as uh, soon as yesterday. Is that true? Ooh, yeah. 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 I am... Uh, not going to say my age. I think I'm officially <laughs> past that point where I'm going to reveal that publicly, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're the age at know. which age is uh, not shared any longer. I understand. Exactly. I'm well, over 25 is what I'll say. Um. There you go. <laughs> over 25 that's and under 95. I think after you get to that age, you're like proud. You're like, yeah, I'm 96, oh, yeah. 97, I'm curious. 98. Maybe this is a spoiler, but did I just move out of the... Um, car insurance bracket like i might have moved up a level where i'm not in that dangerous realm anymore now i'm just a boring old man so <laughs> anybody older than me is probably like like <laughs> you you folks never get any raid road rage you folks are uh careful drivers people are honking at you to get out of the way and you're exactly. just like, wait, what? You said something? <laughs> um, no. Anyway, I hope that you had a good birthday. I know you've got more plans, so we've got to, we, mm-hmm. we're going to get through this episode uh, to get you on your way for those <laughs> exciting things. Um, the show this week starts with Facebook, um, or sorry, excuse me, Meta. Um, For folks who have not yet heard, Facebook has renamed the company. Uh, It is now called Meta. Um, Meta is at the root of kind of Facebook's next step in its evolution. The company wants to focus on the metaverse, as it so calls it, which is the idea that there is um, an online augmented reality, virtual reality, social world where people can uh, gather around and exist in a space that they uh, don't currently exist in. It's sort of the next evolution of social media. So Facebook as a social uh, media company, uh, a company that makes different social apps, uh, wanted to rebrand itself. There's some talk about uh, Mark Zuckerberg saying that Meta has its roots in the word beyond and Facebook is moving beyond. And yes, uh, then all of the, the jokes came out about, yeah, Facebook's trying to move beyond the fact that it's trash. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, take that as you will. Take that for what you want. The point is, its new name is Meta. And what will be interesting is if people are going to start calling it that. I am curious mm-hmm. as well if it is going to rename the app currently called Facebook, or if it's going to keep yeah. Facebook as it is, and it'll be Facebook by Meta, Oculus by Meta, Instagram by Meta, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, your first like thoughts, that. Matthew? Yeah, I think it's in the, the most similar analogy is Google is now technically owned by Alphabet, which is kind of the parent company. And that's how they bring in the stuff like, I mean, I don't even know if Project Loom is still a thing, but that's how they were trying to send balloons across the world to provide internet to come uh, places that didn't have it. And so like 
it's all kind of Google adjacent stuff, but not exactly Google. So they just made a company beyond just what that brand is. And so I think, I think the Facebook app will still stay around. I mean, just, I I saw people joking. That's like, if they change the name of the Facebook app, just like tons of people would just not know where Facebook went anymore. Exactly. So that would just be really confusing. But, um, yeah, people joked doing. about that, but it's also quite true, right? Like, yeah, no, exactly. that, that is a genuine I mean, thing. Just, people would go, where's my Facebook? Yeah, and it Facebook is one part of their metaverse in many ways. So I think that it is, I mean, it's a very big brand. I don't know if it's a strong brand anymore. And that's why I think the like backside of the story is that there's like a major news dump about how Facebook has acted that's going on in the press. And so a lot of people are kind of taking this as a, like they're trying to distract from all that by just everybody is making jokes. I was like, I regret to inform you that Facebook just changed its name um, (laughs) to Meta. But I think the one, the one brand that is going to actually change is Oculus. And that also, while it is like a cool name, I think even just because of the founder who has left and now maybe doesn't necessarily represent what they want (laughs) to be representing. Um, Yes. They're probably going to change that too. So it'll be like the meta quest is the hardware headset thing and everything. So that meta quest, the meta quest app, um, (laughs) that, uh, that part makes sense to me given that this is the new. Yeah, exactly. So this is part of, Facebook's access to the metaverse. And so if the company Meta, which is going to be, uh, you know, as I mentioned to uh, to Jason Howell earlier, sort of sticking their flag into the moon, sticking their flag into the metaverse, this is the rocket ship that takes you into the metaverse. And so it's no surprise that they are kind of trying to bring um, the Oculus in line with this new meta branding. Yeah. Um, all of these other things that are going to continue to exist as part of it uh, may or may not be renamed. We'll kind of have to see how that plays out. But I did think um, it was interesting that that was the one that they chose. Yes, we're definitely going to make that the metaverse um, yeah, or part of really the, the meta branding. At least. So, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, I think I heard about that metaverse news. It was even six months ago now. And I think at the time I was just like, I have no interest in spending time figuring out what they mean, because I think what is sort of weird is in many ways, Facebook just came about from what people did with it and the growth. And this is so like forward looking and (laughs) all of the interviews are like, hi there, I'd like to go into the metaverse and just like very cheesy feeling stuff that is just, yeah. I, don't, I was about to ask I, you, I don't see there's like there, I can see the vision, but it's being executed in such a like corporate internal video way <laughs> that it doesn't just appeal to people who like the technology of it and the cool parts, not the bad parts about it being run by somebody who, is being proven like in like released studies about how they've just like disrespected people. And so it's a major concern for a lot of people that Facebook is just like planting a flag in the VR world and we're all just going to have to deal with the choices that they make for it. And then that we don't trust them to do it well because they've shown that they're not good stewards of what they're doing now. So I think it is just like, it seems like some super rich guy just like dictating what he seems he wants the future of the whole internet to be. And that just is weird and not what the internet is of just like independent people who can make whatever they want versus being like Mm -hmm. locked into Facebook's like, we have this great ecosystem. That's perfect. It's like a, well, I mean, I'm, we're very much into the Apple stuff, so it's similar in it. And, but it's also different in how they operate. So even just in terms of privacy. So interestingly, it's but it's also interesting. Interestingly, Facebook uh, claims that it does not want to be the uh, sort of owner of the metaverse, the the creator of the metaverse, the, <laughs> the Lord they call of the themselves metaverse. Meta. <laughs> yeah. They, and they claim <laughs> that what they want to do is uh, I can't remember now what the word, there was a, there was a word for it that they used, but like sort of spark the metaverse, um, encourage the metaverse. And 
yeah, whenever you're calling yourselves meta, it is a little hard to see anything other than you as a company. Here we go. It's uh, an article in Engadget. Uh, it says, Facebook says it doesn't want to own the metaverse, just jumpstart it. Um, Which I think that, they've done, like to give them yeah, credit uh, or even just in terms of, I don't know, like five years ago, it's ultimately like, what is Facebook even at all besides the Facebook app? And how do they do anything beyond the, like the newsfeed and all of the issues of that over the last like 10 years now at this point. And so they have at least made a big move and that I have an Oculus quest too. And I have VR in my life that I it's in some ways it's just been so like casual that it's kind of weird. And then now they're really making it official and pushing it forward. Um, but yeah, even just like the term I thought already existed in, metaverse existed in the vr space and facebook then they pretty much have entirely co-opted it at this point so like mm -hmm. i they are doing that but whether or not they're gonna do it well is remains to be in question and based on their track record of how they did social media in general before it's like not not the best outlook <laughs> like they're gonna do it well but there's gonna be a lot of externalities to how they do it and i don't think they it's really hard for a company like that to see those blind spots and how they affect people outside of the choices that they're making and stuff like that so i agree i agree um we also got a hint, a very small hint about yeah. uh, Project Cambria, which is a high end uh, VR and potentially augmented reality headset. As the uh, as Eddie Robertson in On the Verge says, we'll learn more next year. Um, it's very early days on what we got to see of this headset. Um, but Facebook showed off uh, some some continuations of its Oculus um software and the APIs and SDKs it's making available to it to the developers. And so some of that is mixed reality experiences, uh, more iterations on the pass through technology, which lets you see um, everything mm -hmm. in the virtual space or in the actual physical space using the um, the sensors that are built into the headset. Uh, so that I'm not surprised uh, as Developers have kind of hacked to take advantage of some of those things. Now Facebook is saying, holy moly, look at what you're creating. Let's give you even more access. Let's give you more power. And this is clearly a uh, hardware a bit of power that is going to make a difference yeah. um, for folks. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I struggle with this because again, at its root is Facebook slash meta. Um, but <laughs> Facebook slash Meta owns the Oculus, which for me, the Oculus Quest 2 now, which for me has been the best augmented or virtual reality headset that I've used and felt comfortable sort of investing in. Whereas the other ones are either older devices or they are uh, newer, but far more expensive and limited in scope yeah. where maybe developers aren't making as much for them or there are all of these other kind of um, uh, trade-offs that you get. And so it makes me wonder, am I going to stick with uh, Facebook and it, or Meta and its uh, yeah, products or am I going to jump ship? I don't know. I saw, I saw a joke about that. They were like, now you don't have to use your Facebook login. <laughs> like that's your meta login. Same thing, but technically we answered it. No, um, I mean, I agree. I think it's like the same thing where I want really good VR hardware. There's no doubt that that is just good. And <laughs> I think it's just like how they operate it and what the company, yeah, like I was saying, what effects it has on all the other ecosystems as well. Um, but I think I've been seeing, I actually got really into the VR Twitter community just by in Twitter following all the suggested follows of people. And I was just like, this is just interesting. And I follow like 200 people. And so I saw them all, they were all getting really excited about the leaks that of this earlier this week. And so Facebook kind of dropped more details. It's like got a uh, hand strap kind of stuff. And oh, I guess that's, no, I, mean, I was thinking of the, the fitness thing too. That's cool too. Um, but like, I think part of it was even a little charger for your controllers so that you could just set them down on the desk and they would start charging because that is 
kind of part of the awkward or an awkward part of the experience right now is just like you have batteries and you just have to find somewhere to put those things. So it's like, might as well have a little dock for them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the other, the other thing was the fitness, um, activity stuff. Have you, you have the silicon insert, right? Yep. Um, I've got, so I had, um, a third party silicone insert from the, or it's technically a cover, I guess, from, um, I never remember the name of this company, superhuman. Um, I don't even think that's right though. I think superhuman is the email app. Yeah. <laughs> I always do this every time. Super uh, but anyway, Supernatural. See, one day I'll remember. Yeah. I think that's okay. what it's called. Uh, human natural. No, I'm kidding. And that's the fitness <laughs> workout natural. app. And if you subscribe to it, then you get, they send you one in the mail, a silicone uh, cover okay. for the foam. So I had that for a long time. I put in the request for the silicone cover from, um, Oculus itself from Facebook. And it took a long time, but it did finally arrive. Uh, they had the one for the, the, standard insert, but I marked, Hey, not only do I have the standard insert, I bought the different sized inserts as well. So I need covers for those. Those came a little bit later, but I did eventually get those as well. So mm -hmm. I've got uh, all of the different covers for it, but this takes things even farther. This new active pack, um, which makes the exercising with the device. It's not just about sweat. It's also about making sure that you can hold these controllers, uh, very carefully. Um, and that they, you know, they stay fastened. So it says, um, included in the active pack are a set of grips designed to keep the touch controllers from flying out of your hands. Um, there's also an easy to clean face pad, uh, and it is supposed to be shipping next year. So might be a little while yeah. before those come out, but though the grips especially, I think is going to be very nice because even with the straps connected to my wrists, if I'm using Supernatural, I do sometimes feel like, oh man, I've got to be careful that I don't fling these things out of my hands. Spin them around like little nunchucks or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that's cool. I'm glad because I've actually been getting more interested in doing those kind of workout things, but the face pad always gets super warm for me too. And so being able to actually clean it or like the article says, if there was ever sort of shared like semi public experiences, just not having that foam cloth and having something that could be cleaned and mean that people don't throw it and break the controllers it might actually help. But I think that's, what's just so interesting is so much of the VR experience has just happened during the pandemic. And so like, even just like having friends over to show them it isn't something that's happened for me. And so like, <laughs> it's just like these situations have all gone on. It, it has been growing, but people just don't necessarily share about it because it's in your home and you're doing this thing already. It's you're kind of shutting out everybody else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, oh, then there were just a few other things. Um, Slack and Dropbox uh, are supposed to be coming to the Oculus Quest, what will be known as the MetaQuest starting next year, uh, which gives you more opportunities to uh, complete work in uh, your, your VR headset. Um, I like this because right now it is very difficult. If you, uh, for example, want to watch a movie or listen to music with the Oculus Quest 2, which I just wanted to try it out, I had to... I ended up going through this very stupid process of, um, cause I've got a, a windows machine. I could not get it to connect at all to my Mac. Uh, so I had to plug it into the windows machine and then move the file that I was trying to use off of the Mac onto the windows machine. Um, and then from the windows machine, install it onto the Oculus quest Two, and the USB C connection, I don't know if that USB-C is, is one of the faster connections or kind of an old school USB 3.0. Uh, and so it, just, it took a while. It took longer than I would want it to, waiting for the um, audio and video to transfer. And so then it mm. finally got on there and I thought, I'm never going to want to do that again. <laughs> like, it yeah. was a one-time thing. So uh, having Dropbox on there is nice because then you can get mm. and share files there. And then Slack, um, that makes it more of a possibility to truly work in this virtual reality space, which is what Facebook in some ways was really pushing today, is that not only is this a personal platform for connecting with friends, but they really do want to see this being as a, um, a way for you to work, uh, with folks all around the world and connect with folks for work, uh, wherever they happen yeah. to be. 
Um, and the detail on that is all those are run through progressive web apps, which basically just, I think in this essentially it just means you'll go to the Dropbox website or something like that. So I'm curious in terms of actually transferring files locally like that, I guess it could still at least download from the web into the downloads of this, of the software and everything like that. But it did totally make me think that is just a way to build any websites. And I have a website. Should I make a, a VR version of the shortcuts catalog? <laughs> uh, why not? You can like walk I'm, through I'm, the space and see. If you've been uh, following my Twitter feed, I've already been having plenty of troubles with my website right now. <laughs> so oh, maybe I'll have to no. figure that out eventually. But um, yeah, exactly. That'd be fun. But that's cool. Just like, I mean, the fact that you can have Instagram obviously is made by Facebook, but is just kind of funny. And uh, separately, you can upload some Instagram photos from the web now is a thing that they just added. And so I wonder if you could get Instagram uploads for your Oculus Quest before they make an iPad app. But that's just kind of how it goes, I guess. Indubitably. Um, all right, let us take a quick break before we come back with loads more to talk about. Um, there's there's uh, some non-Facebook stuff to, to chat about, and then we're going to get spooky for Halloween. Uh, but before we get there, I do want to tell you about the very cool user way who are bringing you this episode of Smart Tech Today, userway.org. I mean, UserWay is amazing. Uh, it was really cool to hear that we are going to be, you know, partnering with them, uh, that they're going to be sponsoring shows because what UserWay does is so important. Every website, without exception, needs to be accessible because it's a public entity and also because it's the right thing to do. UserWay has an incredible AI-powered solution that tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines. In fact, with just one line of JavaScript, UserWay can achieve more than an entire team of developers. It makes your website accessible. And honestly, that can be so overwhelming, trying to make all of your website. You've got this website set up and you, you, know, you go to it and you go, oh my goodness, I've got to turn all of these into accessible pages. That can really overwhelm. But UserWay's solutions make it simple, easy, and cost-effective. Yes, cost-effective. You can check out their free scanning tool to see if your website is ADA compliant. UserWay's AI and machine learning solutions power accessibility for more than 1 million websites. It's trusted by, you may have heard these brands, Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx, and many other leading brands. Now, UserWay is making its best-in-class enterprise-level accessibility tools available to small and medium businesses. Operating an accessible and compliant website isn't only the right thing to do, it also makes business sense because there are millions of people that require UserWay just to purchase your products. And when you need to scale, when it comes time to grow out that website, well, you need UserWay. For years, UserWay has been on the cutting edge, creating innovative accessibility technologies that push the envelope of what's possible with AI, machine learning, and computer vision. Those big buzzwords, UserWay's AI automatically fixes violations at the code level. And here are some of the things that UserWay does, if you're curious. It auto-generates image alts, so that means it will write those image descriptions for you. It remediates complex nav menus, which are often an Achilles heel for companies. UserWay ensures that all pop-ups are accessible. It fixes vague link violations and fixes any broken links. And it ensures your website makes use of accessible colors while remaining true to your brand. I think that's such a cool feature. Also, UserWay gives you a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website. UserWay, by the way, is also platform agnostic. So whether you're using WordPress or Shopify or Wix, well, you can easily add UserWay. And the same goes for AEM, Sitecore, or SharePoint. UserWay integrates seamlessly with all. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. By the way, the voice of Siri, who's considered, of course, the world's most popular voice assistant, has a message about UserWay. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. 
one line of code. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. Go to userway.org twit and get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Again, visit userway.org slash twit today. And our thanks to UserWay for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. We appreciate it. All right, back to the show. Uh, this is very exciting. Wise uh, just turned four years old. And uh, we've talked before on the show about Wise. And, you know, I, I mentioned, I think it was just last week with uh, Dan Morin here about uh, the different wise products that I have in my home as he's thinking about adding some to his home as well. And uh, wise in celebration of its fourth anniversary has announced some new products, uh, a smart wall switch an outdoor light, which we'll talk about most, uh, mostly because it's really interesting um, revamped smart bulbs and a solar power uh a solar powered device that you can use with one of your um, one of your cameras. So the the first thing that I want to talk about is the outdoor lighting thing because this is so smart. Mm -hmm. um, think about what it takes to have an outdoor camera, an outdoor security camera. Typically, what you're going to have to do is find some way to power an outdoor security camera. You know, that's uh, unless you get one that is uh, chargeable, uh, rechargeable. And so you have to run a cord to the uh, back of the camera, plug it in, or you have to literally run wiring, you know, maybe rewire the outside of your home in some way, or find some other method. So Wise thought, you know what? A lot of people, whether they're renters or they own their homes, will have uh, porch lights on, you yeah. know, their, their front porch, their back porch, their garage, in other places around the home. Some people have motion detecting lights on the sides of their homes, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't we make a device that you can put a bulb into that just lets you sip some power from the socket for a uh, video camera? So essentially what you do is it's a standard uh, bulb socket. You screw it into your porch lamp uh, or porch light or wherever you have lights on the outside. Then you screw a light bulb into it. And then you can plug, it's got a USB port. You plug it in uh, to the side of the uh, socket and run it to the security camera, mount it wherever you want it. And you've got power to the security camera, power to the lighting. And on top of that, now you can even add, uh, s you can add settings for your lights. You can make your lights turn off at a certain time, oh, turn nice. on at a certain time. So it's like so, makes the bulb smart as well. Yes, it makes the bulb smart as well. Mm. And I forgot to mention that it's also, it, you can use the motion detection on the camera to turn, make those lights turn on. Uh, so that to, those to, lights to will actually turn on and turn off right then. I love this idea. I think the only um, downside to this is that you will have to tell people, hey, don't turn off that switch inside the house because it needs mm -hmm. to remain powered. So if you can put up with that, I think this is such a brilliant idea. Um, Wise also makes a smart wall switch. These are growing in popularity as we've talked about. Uh, in fact, you get one of these and suddenly that light switch that's outside that you were worried about turning on and turning off, you, you pair the two together and it works, uh, works quite well. So you can use this um, to, to power, you know, a fan, to power all sorts of things. And they talk about how the wise switch will let you set up for custom actions. So a single press will turn on the lights, a double press locks the doors, a triple press turns on the robotic vacuum, and press and hold <laughs> will spray unwanted guests with the wise sprinkler controller was their example. <laughs> so there are all of these options that you can add if you've got a wise setup in your home uh, that will help you uh, get everything exactly how you want it. It also has the, the kind of standards that you're used to. Um, the vacation mode, which will turn on and off the lights while you're away from home, timers and schedules, um, and the ability to 
uh, oh, I already mentioned that, set timers and schedules. This currently works with ALEXA and the Google Assistant. So if you're a HomeKit home, then uh, unfortunately it won't work for you. Um, but you can get a three pack of these for $33. That is unheard of uh, yeah. or just about unheard of in this market. This is really incredible. Uh, and then the last thing are the new smart bulbs from Wise, which just have a better um, CRI rating, which is sort of the uh, accuracy of the bulb. And um, they, they can be set to match the sort of color of the sun over the course of the day. It's similar to what Apple offers uh, with your lighting, where the light gets oranger over the course of the day and sort of warmer over the course of the day. It starts out very cool and bright. And then as the day goes on, it will get um, more warm and uh, darker. So very cool stuff uh, that that Wise has added to its product. Like it just keeps adding these yeah. great products that are similar to what you get elsewhere, but um, at a much more a cost effective panel. area. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I was just looking at their website because they just have. It's like, do they? They have like so many random little things, but uh, I mean, not random. But the the lamp thing is like, I have a wise camp that I bought for that purpose, and I haven't set it up in the backyard because I don't have any way to power it. So like, I might just buy this because it seems perfect. I still, I think the thing that I still don't comprehend about wise cams, and maybe this is just true of all security cameras, but can't you just walk up to it and unplug it? <laughs> like in terms of actual security, if somebody wanted the video feed, you could just unplug it from the lamp socket. So like <laughs> that part yes. still just gets me that it's like, it's a home I, monitoring every... system, but like, I don't know. I just think of spy movies where it's like clip the camera wires and it's just like, Oh, you can just unplug these ones. Like, <laughs> Oh, I so, see what you mean. Yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah. I'm, I, mean, I don't know at why the I'm same hung time, up on that, but <laughs> yeah, someone could, break the window of your living yeah, room and exactly. walk into it like, as well. Like it, it's all, it's all fake. <laughs> like our, our security in our own homes is pretty much all fake. It's predicated on people, uh, being afraid to break the rules of society because yes, many a house, if I wanted to, I'd just throw a rock through the window and then get inside. <laughs> but, uh, like, yeah, the same thing applies. Like you could go up and unplug this or unplug the, or I mean, if you wanted to, you could take a bat to a ring video doorbell and make that go away too. But those have, those are usually wired into the home. I guess you could cut that wire, but just like the fact that you can just literally unplug it does feel just like that one level. I mean, obviously this is a very cheap product as part of it. It's not, it is more monitoring and not like a proper security th thing in that way. Um, but I do just think for like 10 bucks to turn any outlet into both like an, uh, a power source and a smart light is pretty, that's pretty awesome for like any sort of lamp setup. It's like, I think most people probably don't actually want a home security system. They just want one camera outside. And so like this could be under $50 to get that entirely. And then it's like fine that it doesn't work with HomeKit for me because it is like, I don't know, it's worth what you paid for it. So like, yes, that's I what I was saying. Get it over HomeBridge that'd be great. But ultimately I just want to occasionally check the camera and that's more important than the perfect home kit setup. It's so like, <laughs> I agree. This is what I told Dan Morin last week. Cause he said that that was his holdout with wise. And for me, the wise stuff works so well that it is okay. I am okay. Cause normally that is my rule. If it doesn't work with home kit, I don't have it, but the wise stuff is so simple to use and easy, uh, to, you know, justify the expenditure. And also I mentioned that, um, it's what I recommend to family members. So me having it is also helpful to help them with the stuff because of all of those things coming together. I don't mind having that one other app that I have to hop into. That app has the uh, Wise floor lamp that I can control in it. It has my Wise uh, robo vacuum that I can control in it. And then it has all of the Wise uh, cameras that I have that I can control in it. And that's fine by me because I, I think I somewhere, I think I might have Wise light strips too, but I don't remember if I do. Anyway, um, yeah, that like it's so good at what it does um, that it makes it worth it 
uh, to have to not have the, all that control within the app. I do have um, an older Wise camera that you could flash the firmware on connected to HomeKit, but I ended up just taking that away because it was slow and laggy trying to kind of hack it together. And I do hope that Wise does eventually add HomeKit support because if they do, they would be the blow away competition. Like they... That they would be the ones to beat, I feel, uh, for anybody uh, to try and come in at this price is good. All right. Uh, what's next on the list? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I don't know why that happened. Um, in a very similar way, um, not exactly as affordable. Um, if you happen to have a Tesla, you can also remotely look at the cameras on your car, the the sentry mode thing. So I'm, I'm surprised. I just don't know much about Tesla. So I I would have assumed you'd already have this, but it's like now you can from the app basically look out those little cameras on your car. And so like you can, I don't know if you're worried about your car getting damaged or something like that, you can literally check it and look outside. So I thought that was clever. Like that is pretty awesome and i mean i know that a lot of cars i guess they mostly have sensors to do the kind of like um what am i thinking of the uh cruise control stuff like automatic Mm -hmm. cruise control to slow down and so that'd be pretty cool to just be able to peek at your backup cam or something like that from your app that'd be that's like i feel like that's actually a pretty legit use i agree yeah um i there's so back where i'm from um there were a couple, whenever, now not so much, but whenever uh, Tesla was kicking off a little more in places other than where you'd see them every four cars in California, whenever they were starting to kind of come to other places more frequently, um, there was a rash of just foolish people who were big old truck <laughs> drivers who were like pickup truck drivers who were mad at the idea of electric vehicles, I guess, and thought that electric vehicles were bad and not, not worth having around. I don't know what, like, I I can't get into the mind of that. I don't know what was going on in their heads that made them on, I think it was two or three occasions, um, pick up quite literally, not with their hands, but quite literally, um, take someone's Tesla and using their big old truck, I guess was how they were able to move it. Um, break it up and set it on fire. Mind you, these have these those big <laughs> batteries in them and then leave it on what is called the Belt Highway in my, my hometown of St. Joseph, Missouri, the Belt Highway, uh, which is basically the 40 miles per hour uh, strip of, of road that runs through a lot of the city. Um, so you can, you know, a lot of places are off the Belt Highway along the way. And so mm-hmm very dangerous for it to be on the belt highway where other dr- cars are driving around. But they did this to like two or three different Teslas where they were just mad at this vehicle for existing. And so they broke it and set it afire and, you know, dropped it in the middle of the road. Um, so sentry mode <laughs> is where I was going with that is I can see why someone would want to have that because there are some people who are just so bothered by the idea of electric vehicles for some goofy reason um, that, yeah, I think I would want to be able to monitor my vehicle and make sure that uh, people weren't yeah. trying to break I mean, it car. still has, I think it's always recorded video but it just hasn't been able to stream it but like i thought you were going to say that the, i've seen that where people just go to key teslas because they're like this person is rich or i don't know they're just like mad about it and and it is like um you're on video now and so like <laughs> you're gonna get reported to the police and caught and stuff like that so it's like i guess you won but also like you're gonna get charged for that now so good job <laughs> Congratulations. Like specifically that one car. Every other car you could maybe get away with or something. It's like, no, those recorded you doing that. So Yeah, smart. that's the one you definitely should not be messing <laughs> yeah. around with. Uh, alas. And then Mercedes is up to some interesting stuff. Um, the first one is that uh, Mercedes-Benz cars are going to be getting Dolby Atmos in 2022. For folks who don't mm-hmm. know, Dolby Atmos is the sort of all-around music listening experience. And by all around, I don't mean it's sort of like a generalized thing. I mean, the music is coming at you from all around, uh, not just your standard stereo of left and right, but above and below and everywhere. Um, so a 
vehicle, I think a vehicle is a perfect place for Dolby Atmos. When I th like, there are some times where when a new song comes out, I am like, I got to go for yeah. a drive because I got to hear it in my car because that's where I've got like a surround system um, where I don't have that elsewhere. So I'll take a drive and listen to Adele's new song or something. Uh, having Dolby Atmos in the car would be very cool to get this very spatial mm -hmm. audio experience as you're driving. Um, I think that would be really interesting. And what I'd love to see is Dolby Atmos come to uh, theatrical performances of audiobooks where the characters mm -hmm. are spatially placed in different places. And then I think That's I'll never cool. leave my car is what would happen in that case. <laughs> well, I'd have to get a Mercedes Benz, I guess, in order to do this. But um, mm -hmm. I think that would be super, super cool. Uh, it's unclear how, um, you know, if other services will, or, or this is what I was going to say. It's unclear if Dolby Atmos support means that uh, the features on iOS that support spatial audio will also be available to people who are in the car with Dolby Atmos. Yeah. Um, but I it would be cool would so. if you could kind of spatialize the audio. I mean, I think when you play spatial audio, or I guess if it's just Dolby Atmos, it says that in the music app. So I assume that would be part of this. I mean, not the like head turning stuff. Cause that just doesn't make sense. Like if right. you're in the yeah, car and you turn that. your head, it'll just do it. So like, <laughs> or like as the car turns, <laughs> you're just like, I don't know. I think cars aren't the place to experience with, uh, cool audio effects while you're driving. <laughs> you're just like, Oh God. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, we don't, you don't want to go too far with it. But um, again, I think surrounding you with uh, music, uh, that might be the place to use spatial audio is that. in the vehicle, is in your vehicle. Yeah. Um, like the, just the enclosed environment, especially, and not being able, you don't bother someone else unless you're sitting somewhere, I guess, and not driving. Right. But like, that's always part. So you can sing, you can listen as loud as you want, and it's around sound. And it's like a small room too. So I, I'll agree. It's the best spot for music. Uh, the last thing from Mercedes uh, today is just an interesting uh, concept that Mercedes is working on. Uh, you may have seen Mercedes vans driving around. They, for some reason, are very popular, at least here in California. I see yeah. loads of delivery vans that are actually made by Mercedes. Um, they are working on an electric vehicle that not only is an EV but it will also work to improve the environment around it. According to Engadget, it says, a f it says fine particulate filters on the front and underbody purify the air around the van no matter what its speed. It even uses cast iron ceramic coated disc brakes that both reduce the amount of dust in the air and limit brake wear. Uh, it has solar panels on the roof to extend the range of the vehicle and reduce the need for plug-in charging because plug-in charging does contribute to CO2 emissions in some cases. And it can further power devices whether or not the van is running, such as tools and laptops. Mm -hmm. So this is like the ultimate uh, EV where it's trying to be mindful of all sorts of ways um, that you know, a vehicle and all of its built-in functionality could be harmful to the environment. It even was paying attention to disc brakes, which contribute to some level of um, air issues. Oh, yeah, totally. That's where all the, like, when you brake and all the, um, what am I, the, just the air quality pollution and stuff like that all comes from your tires and your brakes. I like the part, though, the, um, they should just do this separately from everything else is the camera that looks for potholes and reports it back and stuff like that. Why don't, I mean, that sounds like something that every municipal government should have on their cars and stuff like that. Cause then it's just all up to date in real time and stuff like that. So pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's Mercedes. Uh, that covers that. Um, now some diff different grab bag stuff in honor of, uh, Halloween there is a really interesting thing. I didn't know that Hasbro did this, but apparently Hasbro has a sort of Kickstarter uh, service where they will try to bring different toys and props and things to life as long as the interest is there. Uh, it's a little bit like Lego where people can submit Lego concepts and then the ones that get voted on the most are the ones that end up being made. Um, you can get the Ghostbusters Proton Pack <laughs> uh, the Plasma Series Spengler's Proton Pack. It'll be $400. Wow. 
And currently it has 4,155 backers. It, of course, it is asking to have 7,000 backers. 45 days, eight hours and 27 minutes left. Um, but they it started worked. yesterday as we record. Yes, exactly. So it's brand pretty spanking new. <laughs> so that they already have 4,000 backers. I'm sure this is going to get funded. Um, if you can read a little bit about the, the, functionality but also the what all went into this they really worked hard to uh to make this tool they you know worked with the people and um attempted to make it as realistic and lifelike as possible and then down there anthony at the bottom there's a link to something wand um keep going and there it is nutri the neutrona wand this is another of the ghostbusters uh devices 124.99 um and it will be available to ship oh this is already a pre-order so available to ship on june 1st 2022 and i think that means that this one just you can get uh I mean, but yeah if you didn't know though. you can't just get the proton <laughs> pack you gotta get that's the true too. yeah you gotta get both <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I'm going to keep an eye on Hasbro Pulse for stuff that I actually care about. Um, you know, Ghostbusters, not so much my, uh, interest personally, but I really like that, uh, Hasbro has lab and Hasbro Pulse is working on different interesting devices and, uh, gadgets and props, uh, from different shows. Oh, they have the, mm -hmm. uh, Halo Needler. Did you see that? Oh, no, that's cool. And I was yeah, just going to say all the Transformers toys and stuff like that, too. I I wonder if this is the one that I've seen on TikTok that actually does the transformation and you can, like, say Autobots roll out and it transforms and stuff. It's like... Autobots roll um, out. I mean, I should have had this on my birthday list. Uh, <laughs> yeah, clearly. Next year I can get uh, my Proton back, I guess. Although I think that's a little bit out of the range. Oh, of my God, it's so gosh. expensive. <laughs> So it's like, expensive. mom, for my birthday, it's like, you're an adult man. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you spend your own money on it. <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. It's not that you shouldn't get it. It's that you should spend your own money on it. Um, currently in production is a GI Joe, or sorry, currently uh, in funding is a GI Joe uh, Sky Striker, Star Wars, the Black Series Rancor, which... It's an unpainted Rancor, so I guess you would paint it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why you would spend $350 on an unpainted Rancor, but apparently some people would, so that's fine. Uh, I didn't know that the Halo gun was is a Nerf gun also. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, they worked with, <laughs> like, maybe Hasbro, does Hasbro own Nerf? Maybe Hasbro owns Nerf. Yeah, that sounds um, likely. That's, yeah, that sounds like it might be the case. Yeah, so it's a Nerf gun that you can actually use to fire things, but it's the Needler. Uh, yeah. So anyway, nice. there's something worth looking at. It's not really smart tech, but it was just interesting. They That's were awesome. selling a proton pack that, you know, I'm sure makes lots of sounds <laughs> and fun stuff. Um, all right. We've got lots more news up next before we round things out with our, uh, project this week and our picks of the week in, uh, DSLR news. This is not about a DSLR. Canon, uh, the, the you know Canon as uh, the company that makes lots of very expensive cameras, uh, DSLR and mirrorless cameras and all these things. They for a long time have had their PowerShot line, and the PowerShot line used to be like those were the cameras that I would get every two or three years at Christmas time. Uh, some sort of PowerShot camera, and you'd like slide the the thing and then there would be a camera that had a lens that would zoom out or zoom in uh optical lens and then you'd press the button and take the photo and it wasn't you know it wasn't a very powerful camera but it was good enough uh to shoot some good video i mean photos and then later on became good enough that people would use the power shot for vlogging um now canon has taken its power shot line and said this is where we're going to do spaghetti projects um last year this and I've, i learned a lot about this from a gizmodo article last year um they came out with a uh a oh i can't even think what it's called not a telescope but a, a monoscope but there's another name for it essentially it had a, a really nice canon lens built inside of it and it would let you zoom in on stuff uh that was very far away and so it was a little bit like a telescope um but it uh it 
was they made it like for birders was really uh what it was what it was for was for birders. Oh, it's like a pocket m- monocular is what they're called there we go yeah, a compact telephoto monocular um and they called it the power shot zoom and so i don't know how many of these they sold how many sold i mean how many birders out there were like oh yeah i gotta have this but you could use it to take photos which is pretty cool um as well as you know using it to zoom in on things and it had uh hmm. image stabilization built in uh so you could get a photo of a bird from far away but i found in the video that it didn't look all that great um whenever they were zooming in like 400 500 mm yeah. uh to the, the quality of the image was not great as a device to just see farther i think that's fine but now uh the canon is back with the power shot px and when you look at it you're going to be like oh i've seen one of those in my uh in my work company's office or i've yeah. seen one of those in um the restaurant down the street because it looks like a security camera it looks like one of your standard security cameras that has the ability to move and follow someone but no this is a camera that's got you know ai as they say magic built into it uh that is meant to be a digital camera to capture moments. So instead of you having to set up a camera and uh, capture photos, you just set it down somewhere and it starts to capture video and photos for you. And then it will try to like get the best things. It It's smart enough to know when you are looking at the camera, when you're not looking at the camera, what candid shots look good, what candid shots look bad. I could see this being very, oh, and then uh, it comes with an app so that you can control it independently if you want to, but the whole idea is set it and forget it. Um, I actually think this is a cool idea. The the device itself looks kind of goofy, but I love the idea of having a party um, and just setting this somewhere and being able to look back on those memories. Because in the moment, I don't want to be picking up my phone every five minutes and taking photos or, you know, capturing video. I re- I very rarely capture video at all. And so if this is just automatically capturing video and photos from the event. And everybody, of course, would be aware of it in this in this uh, sense. Uh, I think yeah. that's kind of a cool idea. It's like, I mean, I think especially they say on their web page, you just aren't holding your phone up and taking a selfie. Also, like it is just, they're like, every time you take pictures of your kids, there's somebody missing. It's the person taking the picture. And so like, I'm imagining in my brother's house, they kind of have a, not like an Island, but their counter comes out towards where the living room is. And if it was just right there, it could basically just take pictures of them, like with their son around the house and they could have a bunch of pictures without having to go take it. So I actually, I think it's cool. I mean, I think, even Canon's style, like the the tan one, is it looks just like a seventies computer. Yeah, it does. It also <laughs> has the like, I think of it as a polycom because that was one in my business in the conference room. It's like, uh, but it looks like that. And so, I mean, the black one, I think, is a little bit sleeker, but it's a cool concept. I think it's just kind of one of those things that's like, huh, I never thought about that. Just having a standalone camera sitting there that can rotate around and take pictures and stuff. And I don't know, even I think this is one of those things that we always talk about because it's from Canon. I'm like, okay, cool. They're just taking pictures. But like if Amazon made this, it would be like, what are you doing? Like you're looking at my house the whole time. So like that is always just a fascinating angle to acknowledge as well. Like when it is a purpose built tool, I'm super comfortable with it. Um, Now I I feel the same way. I wish I had the monocular for I'm going to a music festival this weekend. So <laughs> oh, you could zoom right in. You could see the get, nostril hairs inside of the musician's <laughs> nose. I get that um, product. At least it makes sense to me that if you were, you were wearing binocular or using binoculars, you're like, I wish I could just take a picture of this. That sounds like pretty much what, where that product came from. But again, not, this is like something that's practical and in your home, not just for super enthusiasts. So it's actually pretty clever. They should call it, they call it the PX, but I thought I saw on their website that they called it the Pixie. And actually leaning into that cute branding, I think would be smart because it is oh, very yeah. much a like Did you bring the Pixie? little home yeah. thing. Yeah. So they also are being very clear. I like that they also note, hey, you can use this as a um what am I trying to say? They can you can use this as a webcam. Uh so they're like mm-hmm. it has it serves multiple purposes. Well, so wireless, even too. 
yeah, whenever you're not using it um, for being an actual camera to take uh, photos and videos of things, you can use it that way. Yeah, again, you know, I think of my sister especially. This would be a great gift for her. It's not available right now. It's a concept. Uh, although with the details they have, it's clear that it's more than just a concept because they've got specifications and stuff. But getting my sister this because she has a daughter mm. and she doesn't get to be in a lot of the photos um, that she takes because of the fact that she's holding the, the the camera or the phone or whatever it happens to be. And she's like a, she's got incredible uh, creative party planning skills and all this stuff. And so there are all of these great decorations that she puts together and all this stuff. And she doesn't really get to be in that thing on the, whenever she's sharing them. So being able to be part of the moments that you're capturing you, that's the thing about like photos and videos are, a hack that give our brain the ability to relive moments that we were experiencing and reliving a moment that you were a part of versus a moment that you were only observing are two different things. And I feel that it's much more richly rewarding to have actually yeah. been a part of the experience and to have to look at that and have your brain taken back to that moment where you were actually a part of that moment is much more powerful than just going, oh yeah, I remember when I was looking at that <laughs> at the time. Yeah. So you had yeah, to like I think choose really to cool. snap it. You had to choose yeah, to snap exactly. it. And then even this is just to give them credit is it's like, it is like having a little photographer in your house that again, you would, you don't have to be the photographer. This thing can, I do say, I didn't realize it was just a concept and they are saying that it looks like it would be $500. So that is probably, I feel like that's like uh, Canon. They kind of do that where it's like, they won't just give you the really good deal. Like they always have to make right. a bunch of money off of it. Right. It's like their cameras are the same way where they have all of these varieties for specific niches, but especially like YouTubers want just like the one perfect camera. And it's like, they'll never give it to you because everyone would just buy that and not the other ones or something. So that is always a little bit there, but I hope this gets made because this seems like I, I love when you just like, Oh, that's another product category that I hadn't even realized should exist, but it probably would make sense. Although I can see this seems like this very much seems like, in 2025, we'll all just have this. But right now, nobody wants to pay for it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like It's just like eventually it's like, oh, yeah, we always have those cameras, but it doesn't even exist yet. So <laughs> that's feature for you. <laughs> Indubitably. All right. Um, up next, Raspberry Pi has a has its fifteen dollar uh, computer or it's it's really just a, a board, but it is all the more powerful uh, than it used to be. So this is the Raspberry Pi Zero 2 W board, and it uh, is five times faster than the original Zero, but you get the same small size that you would get otherwise. My, my page has stopped loading, so I'm going to have to look uh, as we scroll through here. <laughs> um, so it, they, it says that it was six years ago that they unleashed the $5 Raspberry Pi Zero um, and then the $10 Zero W, which added wireless uh, to, the, to, the, to the board, now is the uh, Zero W2, meaning that it has wireless, or I guess they call it the Zero 2W, <laughs> meaning that it has wireless, but it's a lot faster than that original uh, device that you got. So very impressive. It says... Um, one gigahertz uh, ARM core, and it has uh, 512 megabytes of RAM. Uh, so these are very small chips that are meant for very small processing, but again, five times faster than the last one. So f whatever folks were doing on the last one, just imagine what they could do with this one. We can't wait to see what you do with it. <laughs> and it's 15 bucks. So like, yeah, 15 bucks for a computer. It's, I mean, that's basically what you've got there. It's got tons of like the HDMI and micro SD cards and all that. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm impressed. I might have to get one of these and then find some product product project I can do. I'm sure Burke, uh, is, is pumped by this, probably going to buy a bunch of them and make some cool things. Uh, as, yeah, he's as in Burke points out, like <laughs> 1080 at 30 frames per second, all for 15 bucks. That's so impressive. That's more than like agree, Apple Burke. laptops can do. So <laughs> some of them still have 720p webcams. Yeah. Oh my. Oh my. Um, so this is, this is great. Uh, love to see 
Because just last week I'd reported that uh, they had to raise the prices on the Raspberry Pi for the first time in the history of the company because uh -huh. of the chip shortage. And so I know they were bummed about that as much as uh, people who are, you know, watchers of the company were bummed about that because it meant that, um, you know, these low cost computers were suddenly costing more. But uh, yeah, they, they got it ironed out. Are there, you know, they, they said it's temporary and that they'll go back to the previous prices. It's just while there's a chip shortage. Um, the next story is kind of an interesting one. It's about uh, McDonald's. So McDonald's has this thing called McD Tech Labs. And McD Tech Labs was this, this uh, part of the company, part of McDonald's that was working on bringing, uh, bringing, new tech experiences to the uh, to the fast food marketplace. So you can think of it like um, automated experiences for drive-ins and or drive-throughs and uh, internal restaurant experiences. Uh, IBM is acquiring McDonald's McD Tech Labs and the company may uh, end up making future uh, drive-throughs with IBM. So instead of it being like McDonald's was done with this and they were ready to move on, um, it seems like they felt like IBM would do a better job of having this technology, but they still plan on making use of it. So there may come a time whenever you will, you know, drive, if you, I guess, go to McDonald's, you drive up to McDonald's and you order from a uh, an AI at the at the box and then you go up and much of the process is automated, um, which is interesting. So there's going to be voice technology involved. And uh, it says McDonald's has made progress in implementing uh, the technology at its stores. The company announced it was piloting the firm's voice ordering technology. The units, which use computers to collect orders when possible, saw 85% order accuracy and only about 20% of orders require employee intervention. So it brought down employee intervention um, and mm -hmm. apparently improved upon accuracy, uh, particularly because I look, I think there's a certain yeah. psychology to this. If you are the one typing in something or speaking something, um, probably more typing in, it's kind of hard to argue that it's someone else's fault. <laughs> and so, you know, where, uh, if I, if I order something, which I wouldn't do this, but if I were to order something and then I decided I wanted something else, or I, I thought I said something else, but I said this, then I could argue, well, you just didn't hear me right. You know, you, you misheard the order. This is what I wanted. But, uh, I imagine that accuracy improves when someone can't claim inaccuracy in cases where they were inaccurate. It was, is my point. Yeah. I mean, it definitely makes sense. I, I hadn't really processed that, but just in terms of ordering, that's probably the biggest issue is communicating over those like, hey, can I get your order kind of thing. <laughs> so it's, it is just like, or if it could even, the AI basically guesses and then the person just like confirms based off of what it guessed. That is just like, I don't know, another level of just like speed and accuracy because a lot of times that checkout experience is like in many ways for drive through that's the only part of the experience is interacting with them. And so if it is just completely seamless, that makes sense. That's cool. You never think about that. Like, I don't know. I mean, they're very, very motivated to have every part of that be perfect. And so they invest a lot in drive through technology. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, and then the last story I wanted to cover here was Android 12 L in the shape of an L on her <laughs> forehead. Um, Android 12 L is, I don't know what the L stands for. I'm guessing large, maybe. They just got there at that point because they've, they've been going through the alphabet for years. And no, years. but that's, that's yeah, but that is, that's that? not tied to this. Um, uh -oh. So Jason Howell was explaining this earlier, but he's, he, even he doesn't know what the L stands for, but I like large <laughs> because this is about, uh, tablets. Um, so Android 12 on its own, this is kind of, think of this Android 12 L is like iPad OS. Um, it adds some very tablet focused features, including a dock, 
And then also what they're calling dual pane interfaces, which is basically side-by-side apps. Um, Hmm. It's pretty cool, Android 12L. It's in developer preview right now. And it is, see, an OS optimized for large screens. So I do think the L stands for large. That's my guess. Uh, It is a multitasking update to Android 12. And frankly, it's about time that uh, the... Google's Android tablets, or I guess whomever is making the Android tablets these days, uh, get some features that are specific to using Android on tablets or foldables, basically large screen devices that uh, you can have more room to spread out with and you can, you know, get to a dock and you can uh, use a, a sidebar and all of these different features that are made for this. I think this is great. Nice. That looks cool. I got to get this just makes me realize that I thought that they were still, I mean, they did L years ago, like the actual L one. And I'm pretty sure they did move away from the the naming system a couple years ago, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They stopped doing that. Cause I made the joke. I said, is this Android, uh, does the L stand for, I don't even remember what I said earlier now. Uh, uh, Lollipop round two, I think is what I said. Uh, Because yes, they did have Android 12 lollipop before. Uh, There are internal Um, code names still. And apparently it was snow cone. And last one was Red Velvet Cake. So now I'm hungry. Thanks, Google. Oh, man. (laughs) Darn it. Now I'm hungry. All right. Uh, Let's see. Oh, let's go ahead and move on to the project segment up next. And then we will round things out with our picks of the week. Matthew Casanelli, you had a little article talking about how to spookify your Halloween using some uh, smart gadgets and some smart tech. Uh, You want to tell us about how we can add some spooky lighting to our smart home. (laughs) This is clever. Um, And it's kind of all related to this app called Signals for HomeKit from the developer Matt Corey. Um, He does, he has an iOS app too, but he just recently, I think he's been working on the Mac app all summer. So I think he had a version out earlier, but at least, um, it, the big thing with shortcuts for or with the Mac is that it can trigger automations that run your shortcuts. Um, and so shortcuts for Mac also just came out this week for the first time. It's been in beta for a very long time, but it's very exciting. And so it means people who are into shortcut stuff can automate all kinds of just making an easier scripts and interface for automation on the Mac. Sometimes that stuff has already existed for years, but it's I just never knew how to do very basic automator stuff or even just where do I put it and then use it. Shortcuts kind of can give a front end to a lot of that stuff too. Um, But on the flip side, any third party apps can do whatever Mac apps can do and they can trigger shortcuts, which has either a command line interface or um, just an Apple script trigger. That's how I use it for a stream deck. Um, But basically in general, what signals does for just iOS is it basically just flashes your home kit si- lights like it's a signal um, because that's just something that's not easily doable in home kit. You can't turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. It's like Hue and a lot of that stuff, they have methods of doing this, but just in terms of a native experience, it's pretty much not possible. Um, and so signals for home kit lets iOS users just trigger trigger those. Um, I had a shortcut automation for the sound detection feature that they have so that if I heard shouting, it would flash the light in my office. And my theory was that basically I would be wearing my AirPods Max and my girlfriend would come into the room and I couldn't hear her. (laughs) And I'd be sitting here just like dancing to music or something and she's like yelling at me. And so the light would flash and I would tell that she's doing something like... Not actually most of the time, or I I had some other um, triggers as well, but just in terms of functionality, Signals provided that. And so he's brought the app to the Mac now too, and in the process, basically made it so that it can monitor HomeKit events and trigger shortcuts in reaction to that kind of stuff. Um, So basically he he wrote an article explaining how you can use either a doorbell or a motion sensor to set up a like Halloween based automation using signals. And then part of it also um, can send multiple home kit events at once because the app can trigger a shortcut, but then also because 
signals itself has automation triggers for uh, that he built into it, it can send something to while your shortcut is running, which is otherwise something you can't do with HomeKit. Everything executes sequentially, so you can't have the lights turn on and a spooky sound plays. It would do lights turn on and then a spooky sound plays. So his he had a whole article explaining how he basically is... <laughs> sorry, it's like he's using the whole setup. Um, he's got a shortcut that has the audio file for a spooky laugh embedded in it using a technology called Base64 encoding, which turns the actual MP3 into like a giant, crazy long string of text. You can see in the screenshot, it says a like 800 <laughs> times because that's how like the bit file for the MP3 looks. Um, but basically then he also has a signal so that when, um, I think he says the doorbell is probably the best because motion sensors, it's like if you pointed at the street and a car drove by, it would start, the lights would go off and make a spooky sound in your house. Um, but the doorbell is just the perfect one. And so you could have it like cast the audio to a home pod and go ooh, 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 and have the lights flash red <laughs> when somebody does that. And so this is very like, he's going full on from like, this has never been possible before to like, here's just a perfect little home kit automation for Halloween specifically. So I thought this was cool. Um, signals for home kit itself is great. A super great automation app for the Mac that ties in with shortcuts for Mac and just for iOS is just a cool functionality that otherwise you can't really get of just the quick flash a light or like flash it three times really quickly or something like that. So both, good automation tool for the Mac and just a good iOS app for HomeKit as well. And just because shortcuts for Mac is out, like this stuff is so cool. There is a uh, HomeBot, which we've talked about before, or I think it was Home Control from the same developer, which was a HomeKit menu bar option that you could then trigger with shortcuts because it would use the keyboard shortcut for that HomeKit event. Um, he's got another one, another app now that can control it all natively. I saw one that's um, Aaron Pierce, who makes Home Pass and Home Cam, uh, Home Run, all those other HomeKit ones that we've talked about. He has an app out called Home Log that runs yes. on the Mac and just logs events that are happening in HomeKit. Um, I do think he's had a little bit of instability because it's like they're just logging hundreds and hundreds of events. And so the stuff is all kind of new, but definitely all those apps are worth checking out as well, because there is just this whole opportunity for Mac based automation to both just trigger home kit stuff naturally and to kick off shortcuts, which then can control all types of Mac and iOS apps and services. So it's pretty cool that for people who are in Apple's ecosystem, there is like a whole desktop automation experience that can hook into all of your home automation too. So even Homebridge and I don't think I even thought of the implication of managing Homebridge stuff with shortcuts via the Mac. Oh my God. <laughs> this is like, there's just a whole new paradigm that I just like, because when you, whenever you think of iOS, you're like, oh, I can never do that because of iOS limitations. But on the Mac, it's like, there's, it's the wild west out here. So if you have the idea, you could probably build it and get it to work, which is pretty, that is pretty cool. So yeah, link to that in the show notes so you can read it through it and check it out yourself. Um, I used to, uh, over at iMore, write little smart home articles for every holiday. Uh, so, so I'm sure somewhere on the iMore site, there's, um, recommendations for like <laughs> how to use your hallow, how to use your smart home for Halloween lighting, how to use your smart home for Valentine's day, how to use your smart home for the 4th of July. Uh, I can remember writing a bunch of those and yeah, this, this is always a fun time to get to experiment a little bit more and try something out that you wouldn't normally try. Um, and I got to tell you, Signals is great. Uh, just like the simplest way, rather than using a bunch of different tools to try to make your lights flash, <laughs> Signals makes it so simple to do exactly. where others uh, really fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the final segment of the show, our picks of the week. Matthew, we will start with your pick of the week, uh, a birthday present to 
to rival all birthday presents. I and think so, at least. This was just perfect because I feel like my first reaction was like, Micah's going to be happy about this because uh, <laughs> my parents got me the Ember mug in black 10 ounces, which is the coffee cup. I have it here with me that sits on a little um, magnetic charger. I can't think of the word for it, right? The pin charger and basically works over Bluetooth to connect with your phone so that you can turn it on and heat up your coffee. And so Micah, I don't have to microwave my coffee ever again. Yay! <laughs> exactly. Bless um, you and that delicious coffee that never has to be buzzed by the microwave. <laughs> Just nuked it down. Um, I feel like this was the perfect way to get this present, because this product, because I think I said on this show, I don't want to pay for this. <laughs> it is like too expensive to... It's like, I think it's 99 bucks for this model and then 129 for the other ones. And so it's, it's just a lot of money for a cup. Um, <laughs> and also the fact that it comes with privacy implications and like all these decisions that I have to make is pretty funny too. Um, do you want to take that part? But like <laughs> the, they're trying to track my caffeine intake yeah, and I have to yeah. give them permission <laughs> for a cup. So... Uh, this is this is interesting. Um, back again. This is another iMore thing. Um, I so I had the original Ember before they came out with the new version, and it used to be that you could uh, get the Ember mug and you could set it up with the app, and you never had to create an account. Uh, then they added the account feature, but for a while there was a way to kind of skip having an account, and then you could set up uh, your mug. And then the last time I set up a mug they didn't give you the skip option. You did have to create an account. I'm curious, Matthew, really quick. Did you, uh, were you required to create an account in order to set up the mug? I went through, I took a screenshot of the permissions because I don't think it had made me, it might've made me set up an account, but it's, there was a whole like privacy policy page and yes. the share with data with them was turned on. Yes. And I just turned it off and I can still use it. So like, yeah, I don't so know that if that part... just means it's not, I can still get the features without it tracking me, which would be great because I, I do want to, I mean, I just don't know. I haven't had it long enough to actually know if it's a good experience or not. Um, yeah, that's the whole other thing uh, beside that. So the, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure uh, at least the last time I used the app, you had to create an account. So at the very least, the company could be tracking your usage of the mug, um, not knowing, you know, caffeine intake or anything like that if you don't give a permission, but at the very least, how often you charge it, uh, when you update this the software or the firmware, I mean, um, when it's empty versus when there's something in it, that stuff may be being collected by the company. The company also offers the ability to uh, track your caffeine intake. So you can uh, turn on the setting that gives the app the ability to read uh, the caffeine levels that you have in your uh, health app for iOS or write to that. And mm -hmm. when this feature was enabled and when the account uh, system changed where you had to create an account, I kind of went on a little spiel about it because I was very frustrated. I did not feel that it was good for the company to make me have to sign up for an account to use the mug when they offered a way to do it without needing an account before. And yeah. then on top of that, to want to track my caffeine intake, which again, you can opt out of, but what they don't make clear unless you read the privacy policy, which I did, is that then they can use that information too. And I don't like exactly. any app digging into my health app and pulling anything out of it if it's going to be using that information for its own purposes. So like I selected I, don't share data, but also I have to choose to be in the, it's like they call it the Ember times or X Apple health program, which implies that it's like some sort of deal that they have with Apple to integrate this. But what actually it is, is they chose to make it this way so that, you have to opt in to the entire thing, not just give permissions to the health app. It's I think it's like, even though I've chosen not to send data, if I choose to use the health thing, that essentially is overriding the other one, but that's not clear. Yeah, so um, in any case, 
I love this mug. I think it's great, but I, I recommend it to Matthew and I recommend to anybody who's using it. Do not opt in to the caffeine tracking or the uh, data tracking at all. Uh, the privacy policy is not great. And so I don't think that you should, uh, if you, it is. it's not worth it's not worth giving up the data that you are giving up if you want to, um, exactly. you know, have that tracked. You could just track it uh, independently of, of the exactly. app. Exactly. I was going to say, I'm going to definitely use a shortcut, even like when I open the Ember app, log caffeine or something like that could be a simple one. I mean, I do. I think I will test it just to see because I don't even necessarily understand accurately or just like. I know that Phil's has twice as much caffeine as every other type of coffee, so like it actually would be dangerous for me to use this because it would be wrong and I would be overloading myself with caffeine and not understanding. So like that specifically has been a problem for me. Um, and it was just funny that it's like, Oh, I want to keep my coffee hot all day. Now somebody is logging my IP address and how much caffeine I, it's just perfect internet of things like nonsense in many ways that it's like <laughs> you have to trade all this stuff over but also like i'm looking forward to having warm coffee so like <laughs> uh modern life very much that sums it up right there it's just like you want the small little thing and now like the metaverse knows how much coffee <laughs> that you're over caffeine <laughs> unless you're exactly. also like changing the temperature all the time you could just set it and then delete the app or yeah, forget the exactly. bluetooth thing. that's true that is very true yeah because i just have mine at 145 um oh, is that, oh, that the was idea? the <laughs> so 140 is supposed to be the best for lattes 145 is supposed to be the best for like plain black coffee um but what i've found is in the mug in particular you kind of want to take a spoon to it every now and again and stir it because the temperature sensor is at the bottom. And mm. what ends up happening is the coffee at the bottom is obviously cooling a little bit slower than the coffee, you know, higher up because it's the, the heat yeah. is leaking out at the top. And so when you go to take a drink of it, you're getting this, the fluid on top that is cooler than the fluid underneath. And it's not rewarming that fluid because that fluid is not um, near the bottom. That is it, it, because that fluid is not telling the temperature sensor, hey, I'm cooler because it's still sensing the kind of hotter. Yeah. So anyway, point is, uh, another recommendation is to put a, a spoon or something in there that you can use to stir it every now and again. Um, and that's why I was telling Anthony, I think I'm wanting next time I buy an Ember product to switch to the travel mug because that would do a better job of making sure that the heat is not escaping out of the top of it. And so it'll stay warmer for longer. Uh, <laughs> for folks who are listening and not watching, Anthony is very uh, clearly bragging with his <laughs> travel mug right now. Fancy travel mug. Nice. 135. Five. I, I nice. still am at least I'm glad I mean I was discussing with you whether I should exchange for the bigger one and then after talking about how much caffeine I have it's like nah, I should probably not have 14 ounces of coffee per cup it's like <laughs> yeah I was gonna <laughs> say and I, I what I ended up telling you too is that I have the bigger one and I I never fill it up to the top or near the top even exactly um, it's still smaller so I didn't even really need to get the bigger one all right. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk about, it's not a smart tech thing. It's just a quality of life thing. Uh, you, life is too short to waste your life on poor quality spices, on poor quality <laughs> uh, flavor enhancers. And I have to tell you, one of the best things I ever did for myself was start buying products, uh, spices, things like that from The Spice House. You can find them at thespicehouse.com. Uh, they source incredible quality spices and blends from all over. Uh, I was telling uh, the gentleman before the show kicked off that the they have this smoked paprika so my, if someone were to say, what's your favorite seasoning? What's your favorite spice? I would tell them smoked paprika. And uh, 
I, <laughs> little old me, had no idea that there was an even better, outstanding, incredible uh, paprika out there. And that is from the Spice House. I have the, the smoked Spanish sweet paprika. I've yet to try the hot paprika. I'm going to get some of that soon. It, you smell it and it like transports you to another world of amazingness. I use it on uh, ground turkey. Um, it is amazing. Their, uh, their, what is that called? Chili powder, uh, equally incredible. I was saying that I bought some um, ground cumin uh, from the Spice House and uh, it blew me away. I mean, I opened the box and I could already smell the cumin. I opened up the little flat pack and about got knocked out by how how <laughs> intense the aroma was. Like that is how spices should be. There should be enough oils in them. There should be enough of the the actual stuff that makes up the spice that it knocks you off your feet or just about. And then the other thing I was telling Anthony in particular, who is uh, a, a mixologist, that uh, they have some fantastic uh, essences or, or uh, extracts. And so I ended up buying the bergamot extract from um, the Spice House. This was actually my first thing. I bought the bergamot extract because I wanted to make some Earl Grey macarons. And they, uh, I knew that I was looking for a place where I could get good quality bergamot extract. And this was the only place I could find online that I trusted, like giving my money to. Uh, and so I got it and smelled it and, you know, used it. And it was so good that I thought, okay, well, this is where I'm going to go. Uh, they have a really good uh, hot chocolate mix as well. It's called, it's like Indian hot chocolate, I think. It's got these really delicious cardamom, uh, clove, and I think even nutmeg uh, spices in, uh, in there. Let's see. It's called not hazelnut, not salted caramel. I wonder if they're making it these days. Uh, it could be out. And yeah, I don't, I don't see it. But anyway, it was um, an Indian spice hot chocolate. And you just mix it with, uh, with um, milk or water, whatever one you want to use. And then on top of that, they have all of these different blends um, that you can get. And so I've purchased the Chipotle uh, barbecue, barbecue Chipotle garlic blend, I think it was, and used that with, um, with some barramundi uh, fish and then uh, some roasted asparagus and Oh, with the smoked paprika there and you've got the chipotle barbecue garlic, it all just comes together and the flavors are so fantastic. Um, you, the, the cool thing about uh, the Spice House is that you can order flat packs, which are those little sort of um, little small pack. There they are, these packaged containers. They will ship for free. So even if you get, you know, only one or two things, you don't have to worry about shipping on those things. I've also, and this was what brought it up too, is that uh, I bought their pumpkin pie spice. Not only is their pumpkin pie spice amazing, but what I often do is when I'm making, because I uh, lately, I have a, I, I have a high fiber, high fat diet. And so I do have uh, some heavy cream in my coffee in the mornings. And so just mm -hmm. to add a little punch to it, I'll throw in some pumpkin pie spice and it makes this delicious mm -hmm. fall latte uh, that'll beat the pants off of any pumpkin spice latte you would get at Starbucks or elsewhere. Um, and then the last thing, there was one more that I wanted to mention with uh, the spice house, uh, the pumpkin pie spice. Oh, Oh my God, if you like cinnamon, you have not lived until you have had their Saigon cinnamon. This is the, this cinnamon is a special cinnamon that has, um, it has, there's, yeah, high volatile oil content. And you, oh my God, just smelling it was, <laughs> it was so awesome. I just was, I just, I remember opening up the flat pack and just holding it up to my nose. And I was just like, I could sit here all day and just sniff this because it's very potent. Um, there are more subtle cinnamons that you buy at the store, but the Saigon cinnamon is next level. Uh, Burke asked me about their, uh, saffron. I don't know. I didn't, I haven't bought any of the saffron threads because saffron is very expensive, first of all. And I have not used, um, 
I, I, I don't have many recipes that call for saffron, uh, but I imagine it's amazing. Uh, I wouldn't, I couldn't see why it wouldn't be amazing because all the rest of their spices are incredible. And what I love is that they source them from different places depending on what it is. So if you look up uh, peppercorns, you will see that they've got like five or six different types of peppercorns that you can buy. The European peppercor peppercorn blend, the French peppercorn blend. They've got one that has, I'm sure it's for people who, uh, the Royale peppercorns. It's got like pink uh, peppercorns, white peppercorns, and black peppercorns. So you can get all sorts of different uh, kinds. And then they've got something called long pepper, which I'd never heard of. Um, hmm. And so I'm thinking about trying some of that. Uh, and they even give you some recommendations for how to make use of these different uh, spices. So all of that's to say, I know this has nothing to do with uh, smart tech, but if you're looking, especially with um, the holidays coming around, if you're looking to sort of pep up your recipes or you just want to kind of treat yourself to something that's outside of the standard, don't buy those thousand year old jars of seasoning at the grocery store. Get some from the Spice House where it's fresher, it's sourced from these different locations. And my God, it, it, is genuinely like, I'm so happy with my my garlic powder, even my onion powder. They make this toasted onion powder. <laughs> I'm just thinking about all the oh, spices in my delicious. cabinet right now. Oh, so I feel good. like it's a good present to, to give to somebody. Yes, it would be a great present. And they also have these uh, value packs where you can get like the standard spices kit. And I think it's for, like 75 bucks, you get all the standard spices. So a great housewarming gift, especially, or a college kid moving into their first home or, I mean, all sorts of things. So yeah, I, I'm not being paid by the Spice House or anything <laughs> like that. I just, I want everyone to be able to try the Spice House's stuff because it's so amazing. And I didn't know that there was a place like that out there where I could get these kinds of spices uh, very easily and like shipping was on time and the packaging is great. And they, you know, it was all very well done. So yeah, nice. love it. Cool. Good recommendation. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode of Smart Tech Today. If you have questions, thoughts, feedback, or you want to share the spices you bought from the Spice House, I would love to know. Yes. STT at twit.tv. Uh, you can tune in live to watch the show every Thursday around about 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, or we think that it's great if you subscribe to the show by going to twit.tv slash STT and clicking to subscribe in audio or video formats across all of the different places. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We try to be on all the different platforms. Um, if you would like to get all of our shows ad free, we have a way for you to do that. For seven bucks a month, you can check out Club Twit. Yes, Club Twit, our special club. With that, you get all of our shows ad free. You get your own personal little feeds that have all of those shows. You get access to the members only Twit Plus feed that has outtakes, behind the scenes, special content from us hosts that you won't get uh, anywhere else. And you get access to the members only Discord server where you can chat with hosts, chat with uh, your fellow Club Twit members. It's a lot of fun. Lots of GIFs get shared there. Uh, if that sounds fun to you, seven bucks a month, twit.tv slash Club Twit to support us directly, which we appreciate. Uh, we did hear that some folks wanted to support their favorite shows directly. And so we gave uh, some people the ability to do that. If you use Apple Podcasts to subscribe to the show, uh, then you can head to Apple Podcasts, search for the audio version of any of your shows on Twit, and subscribe for $2.99 a month. Uh, with that $2.99 a month subscription, you'll get the audio version of the show ad-free. Uh, so a really great way to support the show directly, and it doesn't cost as much as Club Twit. But if you want the whole experience, you got to go for Club Twit, and we'd love to see you there. Matthew Casanelli, if folks want to follow you online and check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? Um, you can go to, I guess I don't know the the URL off the top of my head, but my newsletter um, is getreview.co slash Matthew Casanelli. I'd have to look it up, um, but you can find it on my Twitter profile page too. Um, but that's where I send my weekly newsletter all about shortcut stuff. And I just sent one detailing all the features or shortcuts for Mac. And I got another good one coming. It's, it goes out every Friday. So sign up. What about you? Beautiful. 
Uh, you can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee, where I've got links to the places I exist uh, most often online. Um, we will have Jason Howell on the show next week. Matthew Casanelli will be back the week after. So uh, if you are curious to hear about Jason Howell's Android setup, more about Jason Howell's Android setup and uh, Google Home setup and all that stuff, tune in next week for the fun there. Uh, that brings us to the end. So it's time to say good afternoon to all of our smart assistants. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and good night. <laughs> <laughs> so you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos. Or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands On Photography, here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you and it's going to be a lot of fun so head on over to twit.tv hop that's twit.tv hop and subscribe today <laughs>